Right, Joy. But... Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Shantanu Bos. Uh, Shantanu sir. Uh, yes. Would you like to uh, introduce the ceremony today? I can introduce the speaker. Can yes, sir. The speaker. Yes, sir. That would be you fine. Can listen, you can listen me well. Yeah, yeah. Joe, I can listen you better now. But the okay. picture is because really I'm... bad. I don't know why the picture is bad. You know. Yeah, it is because what uh, Devarun has said, because of the weather, uh, not because of rain, but because of the weather. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Joao, uh, we have a very uh, bad weather today here. There's a thunderstorm going on. So uh, there's uh, some problem in the internet system. Joao. It's still two minutes to uh, three. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to wait for two more minutes before I start speaking. Oh, sure. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. Oh, not it. Oh, sure. Sure. So, uh, Devaron, we'll yes, talk about the uh, geology. Hello, Nilanjan, are you there? Uh, I'm here, yes. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, Devarun uh, can say, is it institute? Uh, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I can say, uh, so no what? problem. Sir, you can say, it's more than one minute. Okay, let's listen. You have to introduce me. Right? Yes. Yeah. So, Shantanu Babu is going to inaugurate. What do you আপনি শুধু ফ্যাকাল্টি মেম্বার্স অফ প্রেসিডেন্সি ইউনিভার্সিটি কলকাতা অ্যান্ড উইথ প্রেসেন্স অফ Dr. Duarte, I would like to uh, okay. ask for permission okay. Okay. to okay. begin this lecture series. Before I begin, uh, I would request all the viewers who are not a party or not participating, please keep your cameras and microphones turned off for the length of the program. Good afternoon and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, hailing from various time zones across the globe, all united by a common thread, that is geology. I am Devarun. member of the Geological Institute and Department of Geology, Presidency University, Kolkata. And I shall be your host for the day. Please keep your cameras and microphones off throughout the lecture. And I repeat myself, please keep your cameras and microphones off throughout the lecture. A question answer form has already been sent to all participants via email and telegram groups. Please check your spam folder if you can't find the mail. If you are viewing us on YouTube, please... Pose your questions in the Q&A form link that has been provided for already in the description box. 
let me reiterate one thing that the e-certificates will be provided at the end of the entire lecture series. On behalf of the Geological Institute, Presidency University, Kolkata, I take great privilege to welcome all of you to the inaugural lecture of Geochron 2020, one of the several lined up over the next few months. Today, we are fortunate to have amongst us Dr. Joao Duarte, whose works in tectonics, geodynamics, and marine geology have made an everlasting mark in an ever-expanding arena of earth sciences. He is currently at the Faculty of Sciences, University of Lisbon, and holds an adjunct position at Monash University, Australia. He has published several papers of significance, and his analog models of subduction zones and slab plume interactions have brought him worldwide fame. Dr. Duarte is passionate about science communication and collaborates regularly with science magazines, TV documentaries, and media in general. In fact, he will be a part of the editorial board of the new Nature Journal beginning October 2020. I would like to congratulate him in this regard on behalf of the Department of Geology Presidency University, Kolkata. He has received several awards over the years. However, we would love to hear more about that from none other than our beloved Dr. Shantanu Bose. I would now like to turn to him to call Dr. Duarte to the dais. Dr. Bose. Uh, thank you, Devarun. Uh, it's my really, I feel so happy today uh, to really welcome to all. I, I know him since uh, he was an undergrad student when I was a postdoc in the University of Lisbon. So it really gives me immense pleasure today to invite Joao as an inaugural speaker of this lecture series of the Geologic Institute, Presidency University, Kolkata. So I will not take much time, but I must say a few words regarding Joao. He is extremely busy now. And I thank Joao for agreeing to our request, despite his very busy schedule. And uh, I will not take much time uh, talking about Joao because uh, uh, his publication list speaks about it. So without further delaying, I'll, I, uh, I, I direct, I'll, I'll just uh, call Joao to take this dais and it's all yours. And we hope, uh, we, we, I'm sure that we'll enjoy his talk uh, and we can pose several in, uh, interviewing queries uh, regarding the initiation of subductions and all. And let us enjoy Joao's talk. Joao, it's yours. Joao, can you hear me? Joao is there. Dr. Duarte, can you hear me? Joao is not there. Joao is there, but I don't think he can hear us. Oh, really? I think he's switching his, his. Yeah, can you hear me? Sound. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you could you hear us perfectly, Joao? Yes, perfect. I, I'm 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 listening through the YouTube, which I think is is better. So it's all yours now. So I hope. Uh, uh, you can start now. The one he can start right now, right? Yes, sir. Uh, we would like to. Uh, we are here for the lecture. Okay. Yeah. So, Thank you. I'm. I'm just trying to see what is the best way to connect the sound. Can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. I will try to put my maybe my headphones. Let's see. I'm. So, uh, we are very sorry because it's so bad weather no, 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 today. Problem. It's you can listen to me well now. Yeah, 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 perfect. Okay, so I'll do like this. Uh, let me just put here. I would like to see you. How can I also see you? Well, I want. I'll try. I'm trying to see you while I'm presenting. Let me see what's the best way. Well, I, would I, I would request all listeners to shut up their. Uh, I think put off their microphone. Yeah, okay. And, and, and camera too. Camera too. But he wants to see people, right? No, it's okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I, I was saying <laughs> I wanted to see the chat. 
<laughs> okay, kidding. so, uh, but that's fine. You just, if something was wrong, just call me. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Okay. Um, okay, so you can, uh, can you see my, I have to share my presentation with you. That's my first thing. Okay. Here it is. Can you see it? Yes, so can, we can see it. So. Okay. okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, the, the introduction. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I'm, my name is John Duarte. I'm assistant professor at the University of Lisbon. I would like to, for me, start by saying that for me it's a big honor to open this this great symposium, the Geochron Online. I think it's, you know, we are living in a very strange times, but I think this also opens opportunity for another, other ways of communication, and so it's great to be here. I would especially like to thank all the students involved, uh, you know, for the incredible work. <laughs> Aken and, and Devarati, they, they were great in contacting me, but all the other students that I saw active on Facebook and Twitter and disseminating this talk. Um, I would also, of course, like to thank the Ge Geological Institute and the Presidency University for the opportunity. And, of course, I could not uh, uh, go away without mentioning and that how happy I am with being here, especially with Santa Nubos. Um, after so many years, it's true. I met Santanu when I was still starting my geology degree. I was helping in the in the, in the analog modeling lab, and Santanu was there, and he teach me a lot of things. We used to compete to see who would arrive earlier to university. He used to be there at 6 a.m., sometimes at 5. It was a little bit crazy, but I, I always tried to be there with him, and we'll start working at around midday. We'll be over, and we'll go for, you know, for a walk in Lisbon. It was great discussing science. Uh, this is so. This is going to talk a little bit about subduction initiation in the Atlantic, and I will provide some insights of the work that we have been doing in Southwest Iberia. This is more or less a little bit of some of the of the authors with who I've been working on this. I've included here Santanu because we are starting a new project, or we have we are working together on a paper that is not directly related with this, but we have plans to. Uh, we are dreaming of a new project um, around this topic, uh, not just in the Atlantic, but uh, different things. So, um, so without further ado, I will, I will um, continue. Um, okay, okay. This is just a simple roadmap of my uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to start start by. Uh, I think for those who are not familiar with the uh, subduction initiation, I would start with you know going from global the global problem, the problem of subduction, subduction initiation, and then narrowing to the to the to the subduction initiation problem itself, and then we will dive a little bit in Southwest Iberia to see what we have learned. Um, so you can listen to me well. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, okay. Just to make sure, so I will confirm. So let's start. You know, why not? Let's start looking by our planet. This is it's a map view, but this is Earth. This is the planet that we are living. And I often, um, you know, I would like to ask, what do you see when you look at this? What is the first order thing that you see? I often ask this question to my students and they immediately start to say, oh, there are ridges, um, there are continents, um, there are subduction zones. Uh, and, and normally I tell, no, no, tell me what the first order thing that you see, what do you see? What is the most important thing that you see in this picture? And you know, after some time, they, they start to realize what I'm trying to say. But basically, what we see here is that you see blue stuff, which is we normally know as the oceans, and you see brown green stuff, which you vaguely see as the continents. This is interesting because they, you know, 
we don't see from the space the, 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 deep, the deep ocean, but you see blue and you see brown, brownish in the continents. So, and the question is, why is it like this? Why do you have this bimodal distribution? Actually, you, when you go see a, a graph like this, you'll see that the elevation, and ah, another thing that is really important is that the colors correlate with the elevation. So you'll have basically the surface of the Earth, of our planet, has a bimodal distribution in terms of topography. You have a peak near the sea level. Uh, we all know why, because we have, you know, we have things that are out of water, but because of weathering and erosion, things tend to be level out to more or less the, the, the level of the, of the sea. And then you have a second peak, uh, at, which is the, the abyssal plains around four kilometers depth. Actually, these deep abyssal plains make around 60% of the surface of the ocean. So it's more than half. More than half is underwater and it's quite deep. The rest, around 30%, it's this peak around a little bit above. I think it's around 400 meters. It's where most of the, of the, the other portion of the surface of the, the planet holds. But this was topography. Let's start putting a little bit more information, more geological information, if you if you want. So one thing that we start to realize is when we look to the age of the seafloor, so to this 60% of the surface of the planet, we see that this is the colors uh, correspond to age. So you, you see that the actually it's quite young. Remember that it's in average, it's around 60 million years. Remember that the Earth is 4.5 billion years. So 60% of the surface of the planet is as more or less 5% of its age. So 60% of the surface of the planet is really, really young. Okay. And this is very unique in our planet. It's, it's, it's this capacity to, re, to recycle its surface. However, not all the surface is recycled, only the oceans. If you look to the continents, they are a little bit different. There's a little bit of recycle, but most of the time, what becomes continent stays continent. And you see that when you plot the ages of the continent, you see that they can be really old. They can be more than 3 billion years. And they have a spread of ages that it's interesting because it actually has a, almost like a cyclicity uh, of different ages. Okay, so the continents are much, much older than the oceans. And that's something interesting and the question is why why it's like this okay you may say we have plate tectonics yes okay but why in what way does plate tectonics explain this bimodal distribution it's it's not trivial it's not a direct link uh, of course you need plate tectonics to reserve the planet but you could just have oceanic plates and no continents right so there's a lot of things that we don't understand yet that we know that they are like this, but it involves a lot of uh, science and it will involve study, understanding the mantle, understanding metal convection, uh, understanding the dynamics of plate tectonics and dynamics of metal convection. But let's talk about a few things that we know. So we know that the reason why the continents stay there is because they are more, are less, are less dense than the underlying mantle. So they are buoyant, so they are basically floating. The, the, the continental portions of the plates, they are floating in, in, the, in the underlying mantle. And they will resist going down in the, in, the, in the convection cells. That's not the case with the oceanic lithosphere. The oceanic lithosphere, when it forms in the ridges, is buoyant. And this is a, a graph in which I'm plotting the, the, a curve that follows the age of the lithosphere from 0 million years, 2.5, 10. And here is the density and, and the, the thickness. As it cools, it becomes uh, more dense and becomes thicker. So after it forms, after 10 million years, the oceanic lithosphere becomes negatively buoyant. So it becomes more dense than the underlying mantle, and it wants to sink. So all these portions of the oceans, they want to go back to the mantle. Okay, they, they form, they are buoyant, but then they become really 
heavy and they want to go back to the mantle. That's why they form these really deep abyssal plains because they are just trying to, to sink back in the mantle, but because they are connected with the ridges and connected with the continents, they cannot go back. They, they resist this um, um, sinking, spontaneous sinking, if you'll say. But at a, at a certain point, that will have to happen because to, to be able to recycle the oceans. Another thing, so that um, when we think about plate tectonics as, you know, the plates are recycled, be aware because it's only oceanic plates that go down. The continents will resist. So oceanic plates, they want to subduct. Then you can make a question. We often see this um, a figure like this in which you see arrow. The arrow basically indicates kinematics. Um, but big part of the discussion was for a few years, it's what drives subduction. You know, wh when a plate is sinking in a mantle, is actually is being pushed or is being pulled. Okay? It's being pushed from the back or is being pulled from its its tip. Okay. And that's that's was for some is really obvious, but for people that uh, some people really have some art art um, and our time to, to, to see it like this. So the best thing is to actually test. Let's test this. Push or pull. So the best thing to do is to look at the observation. So this is the, the world, a simplified version in which you see the, tech, the main tectonic plates. And you have the plate boundaries in different colors. And you have the plates with uh, the vectors, the velocity vectors of the plates. You see that some plates are moving really fast and some plates are moving really slow. And the main two observations that I would like you to, to stress here, or like you to, to look, really give a look is, first, the plates, the oceanic plates, are moving towards subduction zones. So this part of the Pacific plate is moving toward the subduction system. The Australian, Indian, Australian plate is moving toward that subduction system. The Nazca plate is moving towards that subduction system. And the plates that have slabs or plates that are being subducted, that are subducting, they are moving faster than the plates that do not have subduction zones. An example is the Eurasian plate, which is not subducting. Actually, this, you have a subduction zone, but what is subducting is the Pacific plate, not the Eurasian plate. So because the Eurasian plate doesn't have many subduction zones, it's almost stagnated. Same for Africa today. Africa had a lot of subduction zones, so it was moving really fast. And once the subduction zone shut down, it be they become really slow. Okay. So this, I would say that this is evidence that oceanic plates are being pulled by the subduction zones and not pushed by whatever. Because if the, the push, like sometimes you see in a, in the books that is the rich push that creates the movement of the plates, then you know, Africa should be moving really fast and they are not, it's not. So the Pacific plate is moving really fast because it has this huge amount of subduction zones. And there is actually a correlation between the amount of subduction zones a plate has and its velocity. So this is, I would say that is a, a good um, test to say that plates are being pulled by subduction zones. And this has been known for a while, and what, you just have to make the calculations. In, and you can go if you go to a geodynamics book, tectonics book, they, they have the, the formula. So you easily realize that the slab pull force, so this, the force of the this portion of the plate that is sinking in the mantle, it's around 10 to the 13 or 14 Newton per meter. The rich push, which is the force that is related with this. Uh, difference in potential energy, it's much less than that, it's 10 to the 12. Okay? Because the rich push is basically just accounting for this uh, difference in potential energy while the slab pull, it's all this area. So it makes sense that it's two orders or three orders, or two orders of magnitude higher than the rich push. Slab pull is much higher. This is important. So, what we learned from analog models, like part of my work, I, as was mentioned in, in the beginning, I, um, after 
finishing my PhD at the University of Lisbon, I moved to Monash uh, in Australia, in Melbourne, Australia, to work with Walter Schellert in these in models of dynamics of subduction zones, in which we had these big tanks. This is a lateral view of a big tank that is full with glucose. Glucose, it's like honey. And we have these big plates on top of them, and uh, they are made of silicon. Uh, and for example, in this experiment, is experiment in which you have a subducting plate. It's already starting to subduct there, and an overriding plate. And you, I'll show you a movie of this subduction system. And but one very very important thing here is that we are not pushing the plates in any way. So we'll just the only force in the system is the is gravity, and being resisted by the viscosity of the materials. So let's see if this works. Okay. I hope you can see it. Can you see the movie? So yes, thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll put it again. So basically, what we see is that while the plate sinks, this will be like the 660 discontinuity. You know that the slabs often stagnate there. You see that the sinking of the slab causes the movement that at the surface of the plates. Okay. One more time, it's nice to see the plates converging because the slab is being pulled. The slab is being pulled down. Another important thing is that the trench always tend to migrate, tend to the trench, subduction trenches tend to retreat. So this was a very, very simple experiment, but uh, we do, we often do even more co uh, more complex experiments in which we actually track the, um, the mental flow and we can see this, this happening. But this, and I'll just continue with this. Okay, so ah, one thing that I would like to stress here is that we are, we are making a trick here, is that we already start with a, a piece of plate going down. So we actually have to push it by hand, okay? And that seems really important because unless you push it down, the plates will not sink, okay? And that is where we're starting to add, to add towards the, the problem of subduction initiation. It's not simple to initiate a subduction system like this. Uh, one thing that we know, let's just uh, go a little bit more on the, on the global uh, point of view and then refocus on the problem of subduction initiation. As we see, only the oceanic plates subduct. The continents stay at the surface. This create, creates a really nice effect, which is the continents are, are kind of floating on top of this convective mantle that, as we see, it's a, a lot of it is driven by the top, by the sinking of the slabs that create the mantle flow. Of course, there are plumes. The plumes also are kind of a, a bottom-up uh, way of metal convection and exists uh, the two the two act together but if you think about the plate tectonics the sinking of the slabs is really really important but only the oceanic plates subduct and the continents stay at the surface because of this often continents collide because the earth is finite so if you you know you are opening the ocean at a certain point the continents will end up colliding at some point and um, this was noticed uh, the first time by Tuzu Wilson. Uh, he said that, you know, often the con uh, there are places where there were oceans that closed and then reopened, and he mentioned explicitly the Atlantic. Um, but one thing that I would like to stress here, which I think is really important, is this Wilson cycle, it's the cycle of oceanic basin. So you have a continent, it breaks, you have an ocean, and it's limited by passive margins. At a certain point, these margins become active, and then the ocean starts to close. Okay. But this is just one ocean. When we have a, a, a supercontinent like Pangaea, we often have the opening of many oceans, and most of these oceans will close to form the next supercontinent. So this means that Wilson cycle is not the same thing as the supercontinental cycle. Within one supercontinental cycle, you may have several Wilson cycles. Each Wilson cycle is related to one of these oceanic basins. And 
the best thing to illustrate is looking at the Earth today. So we know that we are halfway through a supercontinental cycle. We had Pangaea that broke up. And but if you look to different oceans that we have on Earth today, we see that we have several. You have the Tethyan Ocean that closed completely. So this portion, this Wilson cycle of this portion of the Tethyan Ocean, it's it's gone. It's already in its collision phase. In the Mediterranean, it's still closing. You have new oceans starting to open. You have Atlantic, which is a mature ocean, and you have a Pacific, which is a old ocean that m may end up closing. So this is really important to illustrate that within the present day supercontinental cycle, we have different oceanic basins going through different Wilson cycles, each one corresponding to, to this, its own cycle. But why is this important for the problem of subduction initiation? Because the subduction initiation, it's when you go from here to there, so you have a passive margin and you transform in an active margin. The passive margins are also sometimes called Atlantic type margins because the Atlantic is mostly dominated by passive margins and active margins are often called Pacific type margins. And this transition is precisely what, it's the turning point between an ocean that is growing to an ocean that may start to close. Okay? This has huge implications for, for example, for mantle convection because you have the mantle going in one direction and then if you form subduction zones and the ocean starts to close, then the mantle convection has to, to go the other way around. So it's really this small thing, this small perturbation, this small transition from here to there has absolutely uh, global implications. However, and I put it here, the problem of subduction initiation, we, it was soon realized that it's really, really difficult to break a passive margin. And this is because, as I mentioned before, as the oceanic lithosphere cools, and you can see this in this profile in which basically as the age uh, the evolution of the age, these colors are the age of this oceanic lithosphere. And this is basically the resistance. And you know that the resistance increases as the plate cools, as the plate becomes older, the resistance really increases and the plate becomes really strong. So the older the plate is, the thicker it is and the stronger it is. And it will resist subducting. Because if you have a very, very thick plate, it's really difficult to, to break it, to, to bend it, and you know, to push it down so that the subduction system can start. A little bit like in our models that I was saying, you have to push it down. So it's really difficult if you have something that is really cold and strong. So this is what I call the problem of subduction initiation. And this is not solved. And that's what we, there are many ideas, there are many models. And this is really going big in geoscience today because we have now uh, new, a new, new computational power. There are a lot of clusters now uh, at, um, that the universities can use, the research groups can use, and this really boost, is boosting the, our capacity to model this process. But we're still a little bit uh, away from understanding this process deeply. Okay, this... This is one was one actually we sometimes we call this Wilson cycle, but actually the it was not to the Wilson that named this after himself. It was actually by other scientists. One of the scientists was John Dewey, um, that he proposed uh, very early. Uh, remember that the, the theory of plate tectonics is from the seven, it's 60s and the beginning of the 70s, most the, the second half of the 60s. So right on the beginning of the development of the theory of plate tectonics, um, John Dewey wrote this really nice paper on, that he proposed that Atlantic type margins convert into Andean type margins or Pacific type margins, if you want. So he, he basically was showing here that the oceans, when they grow, they first go, grow, go through an Atlantic type phase, we call Atlantic type oceanic phase, at a certain point, the margins are reactivated and you have 
subduction zone starting, and then you go to a Pacific type phase that allows the, the, the ocean to close. And then you get a Mediterranean type phase and then a Himalayan type phase in which the ocean is completely closed. Um, okay, sounds nice. It sounds like it works. However, just a few years after, uh, there are a number of papers that like, and a few of them are by, by um, Sealed Kluting, uh, of this paper in 1992, in where it shows that, as you see here, as it gets older, oceanic lithosphere becomes really, really thick and really strong. And it make this simple model and even putting a huge pile of sediments on top of this passive margin, you realize that the aging of a passive margin alone does not make them more suitable to start subduction. Just because it's really hard to get the force to break the margin, it's not enough. It's not enough. The negative buoyancy is not enough. The pile of sediments is not enough. And we can actually see this. This became, um, you know, a focus of study. And another really nice paper, and I remember this paper was uh, uh, given to me by Santanu Bowes when I was in, in, when he was in Lisbon. And he said, oh, João, there's this really nice paper. And I remember I read it the first time and I didn't understand a lot, but then I read it again and again and again, and things start to make sense. But this is really, really great paper. And basically, I just wanted to look to these two graphs. So basically, what is plotting here is how resistant is a passive margin that is 200 million years. And you see that the, the resisting force, if, you, if I can, you know, in the simplified matter, say, it's the value is 10 to the 13 Newton per meter. Yeah. They also calculate what will be the resistance of a transform fault. So you would already have a, a fracture zone. So you just will need to uh, bend the plate. But still with the with the transform fault or a fracture zone, the force is still quite high. It's still 10 to the 13. And when you make the calculations, the rich push force, it's 10 to the 12. So it's one order of magnitude uh, less. Okay, the rich push force is one order of magnitude less than it takes to break a margin. So that means if you are in Atlantic type ocean that is, is opening, in that ocean, you don't you never get the forces to actually start subduction. And that's a paradox. You know, how you start subduction in the Atlantic type ocean? We don't have you don't have the forces there. The only force in nature that has the magnitude to break a passive margin is the slab pull force. Uh, and the slab pull force, it's 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14. That will be enough to, to break the passive margin. So the conclusion of this paper, which I find it's genius, and it has been around, Kluting already refers to it, is that it takes a subduction zone to start a new subduction zone. There are not many forces, you know, like there are extraordinary events that can break a plate, like a collision of a meteorite of a huge mantle plume arriving to the surface. Okay, that's but that's very unique events. In general, the only force in nature that can start a subduction zone is another subduction zone. And again, that's, you know, it's, it's the paradox. So how you start a subduction zone in the Atlantic, where you don't have subduction zones? Let's see. Uh, a few years later, and this topic of, it's interesting because this topic of subduction initiation tend to tend to come in cycles. For 10 years, there's nothing, and then people look at it again. They exhaust what can be done, then they, you know, it's leave it again without much advance, and then it goes again. And I think we are now in the phase of uh, looking back to these problems, so and I'm happy to talk about, about those here. So, Robert Stern wrote this fantastic paper on subduction initiation in which he basically it's it's almost like a question he says like spontaneous or induced so it shows oh, you know in this conceptualization how to start the subduction he showed the passive margin collapse the classical you know passive margins get old uh, the they accumulate sediments and at a certain point they go down and they start the subduction zone they collapse but as I showed you 
and I, I hope I was able to convince you, that is not physically possible. And one important observation is that there are no examples, no recent examples of this spontaneous collapse. So these things do not seem to happen often in nature. Okay, there are the transform collapse, so the, the initiation not in the passive margin, but inside a continent, but the kind of spontaneous collapse along the transform fault. There may be some examples, however, I can say that there are other works like by Mike Gurnis that he shows that even in a situation like this, you'll need some pre-existent convergence to start the subduction around two centimeters per year. So this will not be exactly spontaneous. This will be kind of a forced initiation. So let's look to the other panel. So, and that's kind of the conclusion by Muller and Phillips and the conclusion of Stern and Kluting and, all, and Mike, Mike Gurnis, all the, the specialists, the classical specialists in subduction initiation, is that all the subduction systems are induced by other pre-existing pre subduction zones. And it basically shows two ways of doing this. One is, let's start by this one, it's polarity reversal, in which you have a, a subduction zone, at the, you bring a plateau, and the example will be the collision of the Otong Java plateau uh, in, with the Solomon arc in the Miocene. And because this is buoyant, it will resist subduction and will force this plate there to start this part to subduction. So the overriding plate becomes the subducting plate. That's why it's called polarity reversal. The other one is transference. Is actually you have a subduction zone, you have a, 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 a block that can be an oceanic plateau or a small continent that collides, but because convergence continues, it may this is 2D, but in 3D you may think that there will be subduction could continue laterally, then you could form this this margin here could transform in a subduction zone. Okay, and this is, there are examples, and one of great example of this may actually be the Indian Ocean. So if you think that this was the in India, and this was Eurasia, you had the, the collision of the Tethys there, and this collision uh, caused the, the, the formation of the Himalaya, but because the plate, this the, the Indian Australian plate is still being pulled to the north by the a lot of you know the Sumatra subduction zone, Sunda subduction zone. Uh, it may be that the new subduction zone will form in time in the south margin of India. Actually, this was proposed by Seared Kluting in the in the 80s, and it shows, and I think there are some of you may know that there are evidence of deformation in in the Indian Ocean south of of the India that that the passive margin there is is uh, is being deformed. It's I think the deformation didn't localize yet, uh, but there you see some long wavelength folding of the oceanic lithosphere, and you see some uh, fracture zones that sometimes producing big earthquakes. So that could be, and this is one of the things that we'd like to look at, and that's one of the things that we are exploring with Santanu. Um, there's a lot of small problems within this bigger problem. So, some of you may want to see this. So let's see if this works. OK, it's working. I will not. So this is an example. I'm going to show you an example of this uh, polarity reversal, but in 3D. So what we did, this is um, uh, the work by a PhD student in Lisbon that is, is being supervised by Philippe Rosas, Nicolas Gilles, and I'm, I'm a kind of informal supervisor. I'm, I'm collaborating with, with Jaime, and he's doing a really good work because he's, he's using numerical models. This is a numerical model with Underworld. The analog models are difficult because they are really difficult to localize strain. And with, um, with numerical models, you can have some more complex rheologies. Uh, and so this is a three-dimensional space. You see that you have a subducting plate in, in, in this brown. You have an overriding plate in blue. You have an oceanic plateau in this reddish uh, orange stuff. So the question is, what will happen when this plateau arrives to the subduction zone? Let's see what's happening.
Okay, I'll, I hope you you could see what was going on, and I'll put it again. So what happens is, you see that this subduction zone continues there, but when the plateau arrives, it closes the subduction, and then it forces the overriding plate to start to subduct. Okay, so you see that here is the overriding plate that is subducting, while laterally this doesn't happen. Okay, so here this subduction zone, this plate in this area, this plate will always be the subduction zone. Here, when the plateau arrives to the trench, it shuts down the subduction zone and forces this overriding plate to subduct. And this is a really nice example of how you can transfer a subduction zone from one plate to another. I would like to stress here that all these models, in, in all these models, we are not pushing anything. Okay, so the plates are not being pushed. The only thing that is acting here again is like the analog models is gravity. Okay, so it's it, it, this is a closed system, so the plates are not moving initially, so they just move because of the slap pool. So that means that the energy in this system is constant. Okay, we start with the with the negative buoyancy of the of the slab, and then it's which is the only driving force. So th this subduction zone actually makes the a new subduction zone to form in another plate. So you basically are transferring a subduction zone from this brown plate to the blue, the blue plate. And let's look at maybe one last time. OK. Oops. And flip. New subduction zone. OK. This, this will, will be a very efficient way to transfer a subduction zone from one place to another place, from one plate to another plate. And we have many models like this, and this is just a work that we are finishing. So please, uh, you know, if you are interested, it, it will be published in a in a couple of months, maybe. Uh, so let's look a little bit to Southwest Iberia. So until now, I was showing a lot of conceptual stuff. Um, now I would like to dive a little bit with you in Southwest Iberia. And for some of you who don't know, I'll, I'll start a little bit with um, with the history. Why was this region so important? So one of the reasons was that in 1755, there was a huge earthquake. It was the 1755 earthquake. This earthquake uh, occurred at 9.30 in the morning in a, a holy day in, in Portugal and in many places in Europe, which is All Saints Day. And at this day, people go to the church and and that the church, the, the mass started at nine. At, at 9.30, everybody was in the, attending the mass. And there was a magnitude that estimated to be between 8.5 and nine. There are some discrepancies. Um, some people say that might have been two or three earthquakes. You have seen recently, even a few days ago in, in um, I think in Sumatra, that sometimes these big earthquakes, they come in, in in a couple or in two or three. So we don't under really understand why yet. But it was a huge earthquake. And it produced a huge tsunami that was a transatlantic tsunami that uh, killed people in the other side of the Atlantic, in the Caribbean. And at the time, Europe was going from, a, we call it this, the Enlightenment period, when people, before that, people think that all these catastrophes were sent by God to punish men. And at this time, we were trying, we as you know, humans were starting to think that some of this process may add, add natural causes. They, are, they had natural causes. They are not made by gods, but they had natural causes. So a lot of the, the thinkers, the philosophers of the time, they, they start to think about this process. And it, some people said it's actually the beginning of modern seismology in Europe. And everybody was trying to understand. There was ten, tens of thousands of people that died. It's still, I think it's still in the top 10 strongest and deadliest earthquakes in history. 
So people start to think, what caused this earthquake? Why there was an earthquake there? So for those who don't know exactly where is Southwest Iberia, so this is Iberia, okay? This is Europe, this is Africa, the Atlantic. Uh, Portugal is here, I'm somewhere over there. Um, and this was where we think this earthquake was located. And this was the area over which it was felt. It was quite big. And it was felt in the UK, it was felt in Germany, in Italy, you know, of course, in Spain, France, uh, in the big part of Africa, even in Cape Verde Islands and in the Azores. The tsunami you know, destroyed uh, cities and, and harbors in, in the other side of the Atlantic. So this was really, really, really a big earthquake. But it was not the only one. So in 1969, so this was already an instrumental earthquake, uh, there was another earthquake in there. And this was a 7.9. Okay. And more interesting, to, a little bit further to the, to the west, there are other two earthquakes. This is 8.4 and this is 8.9, 8.1, I think. These are magnitude 8 earthquakes, but these are strike slip events which is strange, but there are strike slip events. And I know that there are a few in the Indian Ocean as well, and this is interesting. But this one over there, this 7.9, was a trust event. Okay. And the same as the as 1755, because to produce a big tsunami, you need to be a, a, trust, a trust event, not a strike slip. Strike slips in general don't produce big tsunamis. So in 1969, we were more or less at the time when the theory of plate tectonics was being developed. The, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the most fundamental papers, this paper by Tuzo Wilson in 1965, and for example, this paper by Jason Morgan in 1968, there are around 10, 12 papers that really made this revolution. People were talking about continental drift and uh, spreading of the oceans before, but it is really in this after 65 that everything comes together to make the revolution of plate tectonics. And at this time, around the 60s, the scientists knew that there are two types of continental margins. So you have the Atlantic type the margins, as we have seen in a few minutes ago, that Pacific, Pacific type margin. They are, I'm sorry, the passive uh, type margin. They are passive. Why? Because when you go from the continent to the ocean, you don't cross the plate boundary. So there's no tectonic activity there. Uh, and there is no big earthquakes. On the other hand, if you go to the Atlantic, to the Pacific, uh, when you go from the continent to the, the ocean, you cross a plate boundary, which is a subduction zone. And there are big earthquakes all over. So if you look to this figure here, you'll see that this is, I'm plotting the biggest earthquake, higher than 8.5, since 1687, so in the last little bit more than 300 years. And you see that all the big earthquakes are in subduction zones, okay? And they are all around the ring of fire, if you consider even here, okay? There's one exception, which is this one in the Himalaya, but you can argue that in the Himalaya there is it's continental subduction that is going on and or a kind of continental subduction. So you really need to have this big subduction system to, to have uh, earthquakes with this magnitude. And the question is, why is the 1755 there in the Atlantic? It should not be there. You know, there's, it doesn't make much sense, you know, unless there is something funny going on. And after the, the, this other earthquake in 69, this became really obvious. And so there was a group of scientists that were in the, in the Cambridge, actually in the, in, in the 70s, is Foucault, then Mackenzie, one of the fathers of the theory of protectonics, and, uh, and Purdy, Mike Purdy, um, that studied the 1969 event, which they understood there was a trust event, and it was a lithospheric event, okay? And you see in their, in their sketches that they all showed the lithosphere breaking. And Mike Purdy actually proposes that this is a case of transient consumption of lithosphere. 
So something that is between a passive margin and active margin. So, and then McKenzie, in what is known as one of the first papers on subduction initiation, it's the initiation of trenches, he uses this, this, this region of the southwest Iberia to show that this may be, you know, an example in which you are just transforming a passive margin in a specific type of margin. Okay, so let's uh, look a little bit more to the to the tectonics. So this is going back to this map. So I want to show you where we are. So again, so this is Iberia there, the Atlantic. Uh, you see, in terms of the tectonic context, you have the ridge, you have a transform plate boundary, which is goes from the Azores to Gibraltar. Gibraltar Strait is this is when you go from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, and you have a system of subduction zones that you know are becoming inactive because are inside this all this basin is closing, so they they are just collision zones. It's, it's a little bit people say there's a little bit of subduction a subduction zone there we call the Gibraltar subduction zone, but the 1755 earthquake and the 1969 are coming from here, okay, so. And again, why? So let's look at this area a little bit better. So this is this corner there. Okay, this I'm I'm here now at this moment, and this is Gibraltar Strait. This is where you go to the Mediterranean, and this front is the actually Christianary wedge of this subduction system. There, you have this transform plate boundary until the ridge, which is this ridge, this triple junction there. And you see there is a transform because you have these really nice track slip events, some really, really huge, 8.4. And you have a main, a main, I would say main plate boundary to the north, but I, I will argue, and this will be important uh, for in a, a few minutes, there will be, there's another plate, another fracture zone in the south that seems to be quite active and is producing strike slip earthquakes of 8.1. And the 1969 earthquake occurred in this region between these two trust faults, okay, which I'm going to show in a minute. So how, how do you come to, you know, how was this area, how do, did you get to this present day um, situation? So I'm, I'm just going to show you uh, evolution since the Cretaceous. So this will be the Alpine Tethys. So this will be, at, in the Cretaceous, you will have the Atlantic opening. There will still the part of the Tethy, Tethyan Ocean there was opening. And at a certain point, this Alpine Tethys around the Oligocene started to close. There was subduction system. That's subduction that continues all, all the way through the, um, the Mediterranean and, and, until the Himalaya. But so this is the the western termination of the of the alpine orogeny of this the closing of this big ocean that was the tetish so this was actually where the tetian ocean connected with the atlantic in the miocene the, you had the formation of these back arc basins uh, and there was this subduction zone that was retreating it retreated from there it was moving in this direction and the interesting thing by looking here is that this subduction zone, because subduction zones tend to retreat, it could that been that this subduction zone will actually migrate to the Atlantic. And this will be a really, really nice, interesting case of an ocean, go, uh, a subduction zone going from an ocean with, with subduction zones to an ocean without subduction zone. I can, let me just go back here because I want to tell you something that I, maybe you may not be aware. If you look to Atlantic here, I we normally learn that the Atlantic margins are passive margins. However, there are already two subduction zones in the Atlantic. You have the Lesser Antilles and you have the Scotiar. These are subduction zones that are in the Atlantic. We know by reconstructions that these subduction zones started in this point and migrated there, the subduction zone started in this point and migrated there. They actually migrated from the Pacific in a way to the Atlantic. But note that the polarity 
is different. This subduction zone is dipping to the east, and that subduction zone is dipping to the east, to, to the west. So there was a polarity reversal during this, and this polarity reversal is very, very similar to the one that I just showed you in the models. Okay. So at a certain point, there was probably the collision of a of, of a plateau that is the, we call it the Caribbean plateau with this subduction zone. And this caused the formation of a new subduction zone in the other side, in the Atlantic. It was the, a flip of. So these are two prime examples of this subduction initiation by polarity reversal, and how a subduction system can go from one plate to another plate. But in this case, it's even more interesting because it not only goes from one plate to another plate, it goes from one ocean to the other ocean. Because here you see that the continents are really narrow. So this allows the subduction zones to migrate from Pacific type oceans to Atlantic type oceans. This is really interesting because it shows you that maybe you don't need to start subduction zones spontaneously in the Pacific. Maybe they can just propagate from oceans where you already have subduction zones. And in this case, you'll not have any problem because you have the force. So the, the, this subduction system and that subduction system were forced, were induced by this big subduction system that we know that can produce forces with the magnitude necessary to start the subduction zone. Now look to another thing. This subduction system is now propagating along this uh, fracture zone, or transform zone that is connecting to the ridge. That one is propagating al along this one. And look there. Here you also have a, another plate, a transform plate boundary. There are three. And you have an arc, a subduction zone that seems to be you know, propagating along this. So one of my questions or one of my working hypotheses when I, when I was doing my PhD was, could this be an initial case of a situation like this? Okay. In this case, you already have subductions in the Atlantic, but here it seems like the subduction zone is just migrating. It's just in, in, the, in the limit. In this case, will be a subduction zone that will be migrating from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, okay? as in this case, migrated from the Pacific to the Atlantic. So that was a little bit my driving uh, question, and that's why I think this is important, and why I was telling you that this could have been possible, this subduction could have just migrated to the Atlantic, but there was something funny going on, which was Africa and Eurasia are converging. So Africa is moving to the north. And because of this, this subduction zone became stranded. It, it, it's now being squeezed between this continental block and that continental block. We don't really know. Most of people think that is not, not even active anymore. But in the Miocene, in the Tertonian, was really active. And it probably induced a lot, a lot of forces in this uh, and its front, it was trying to propagate and create this trust front uh, along the southwest Iberian margin. And this this area, why you know why do I know about this? Basically, my the, the work for or the goal of my PhD work was to map this area. Okay, we had a lot of new uh, data from the seafloor, and uh, my my the objective of my PhD was to produce a new tectonic map of this area. And that is what is shown here. This was published in a paper in geology in 2013. And it's a little bit more zoom. So here you have the Gibraltar state, uh, Strait, you have Morocco, this is Africa, you have Spain and Portugal, this is Southwest Iberian margin. So just to make sure, so this corner here is this corner there, okay? And this is very complex, but I wanted to uh, basically focus on two, two main structures. Or, or, or So you have the, this Gibraltar arc, and this is the Christianity wedge in there. Then you have the strike slip faults that related with the transform plate boundary, but the important structures are these yellow trust faults. Because these faults here, they were normal faults. They were normal faults that were formed during the opening of the Atlantic along this direction. And some of these faults are now being reactivated as trust faults. Okay. 
And one of these structures is actually look at this this Gorinje Bank. This is a mountain chain that goes from as goes from minus five kilometers up to almost minus twenty six meters. So this is a mountain chain that is five kilometers high. It's a huge mountain, huh? uh, but it's under the seafloor. And we know that the 1755 was located somewhere over there, over in this area, and the 1969 was located over here. So how do we know this? Because we have seismic profiles, and this seismic profile, the seismic profile along this fault here, we call the Marques de Pombal fault, so is one of these normal faults. You see the normal faults uh, in here. So these are basement normal faults from the opening of the Atlantic that now are being reactivated uh, in these uh, trust faults. This is it's two kilometers high. And this is a, a profile over there, which is actually show you this big mountain chain with this big fold with the sediments being folded with the long limb and the short limb. So this is a, a evidence that our margin, the Southwest Iberian margin, uh, is being, is no, it's no longer uh, a passive margin, but it's being reactivated. We don't really have yet a subduction zone in the sense that you have a, a trench and a, and a subduction zone or a cushionary wedge, but you have a set of trust faults that are there are lithospheric trust faults. And again, it's just this, to show this 1969 event, the problem with the 1969 event is that, and, and the problem a little bit with this, is that this was a, a really deep earthquake. And for some of you that have interpreted seismic profiles, you'll see that normally in the seismic profiles, you only see like 10 to 20 kilometers of the crest or the top of the plate. And these earthquakes are really, really deep. And the lithosphere here is around 100 kilometers. So these faults are just, you know, just showing the, the deformation on top. So we want to see what is going actually at depth. And for many years, we could not see. Uh, we have recently, this is a, a work by Chiara Siviero, with, with, is working with us. She was doing her postdoc in Lisbon, and now she moved um, um, to Ireland. And she produced this really nice tomographic model uh, based on, this is a seismometers, and uh, we in included seismometers that were in the, in the bottom of the ocean. And what we could see, and this is a slice at 150 kilometers, so really below the, the plate, you see there is something there. And for many years, we could not understand what was that. It seems like something was going down. And I can show you in here. So this is a profile over there. Again, the Southwest Iberian margin here, the Mediterranean. This is the subduction in the in the Gibraltar, the Mediterranean one. And you see in this area that is something going down. And you see a lot of, this is a cluster of earthquakes that are quite deep at 60 kilometers. And this is the 1969 earthquake. Okay. And interestingly, the, the big trust fault, the Gorinja Bank, is a little bit offset to the west. So this thing is below a very flat uh, abyssal plain. And for many years, we, we didn't understand what was this thing. Uh, I asked Chiara to, to plot a map. And actually, we see there is something seems to be going down already. But it's very, very strange because at the surface, we don't really have um, a subduction interface. And so how can, can this be? How can you get this thing going down? So uh, before I try to explain all this, I just need to provide another piece of evidence. So when you do a profile, uh, a refraction profile, what we see is that the in this region, the oceanic crust is missing. We go directly from sediments to lithospheric mantle. And this is because this is probably hyper-extended uh, continental margin. So there was the extension was produced in cold. So there was not of a lot, not a lot of uh, volcanism or produce, production of magma. And uh, this lithospheric mantle is actually be, is mostly serpentinized. Okay, it's really the water is going down and it's 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 being hydrated basically. It's really old lithosphere. So 
Tetian lithosphere, maybe, old ocean, old Atlantic. Um, it's really in this transition. Uh, and so this is really important. Why? And the answer start to come a couple of years ago when I saw this figure. I saw, oh, this figure, you know, it really seems to explain that thing that, uh, you know, it's really similar to something like this. We don't have a lot of deformation at the surface, but something is going down. What was the problem? Is that this thing here is the lamination of the lithosphere. And we all know, or at least it's what the books tell us, that the lamination of the lithosphere is only possible in continents because the continents have this, this is the strength profile. So you know that the crust as a strong core and then the lithospheric mantle as another strong core, but there's a, a weak zone in between that allows the, the crust to detach from the, or the lithospheric mantle to detach from the crust. And you, you know, this has been reported in the Himalaya, in the Alps, so especially where you have very thick mountain chains, the, the bottom of the plate just delaminates. But this is not is not supposed to happen in the oceans because the lithospheric plates in the oceans are really strong. So, you know, you will not expect to see this in the ocean. So how can it be? The key, I think, is that this la the lamination of the plate is allowing the plate to have a decoupling layer. So if you have serpentinization, serpentinization basically when you transform a peridotite in serpentine, it really, really reduces the strength of the rock a lot. M maybe not as much as this, this is just to zero, but it really decreases the strength of the rock a few orders of magnitude. If you have this, then you could have a uh, delamination of the lithosphere. So we just decided to test uh, a couple of numerical models, and these are my last numerical models, then I will just start going towards the end of the presentation. Um, so this is a model in which I'm, I have here the viscosity on top. I have the material properties on the bottom. I have a plate that is moving slowly. There is Africa. This is Eurasia. And I put here, uh, we have the crust, we have the mantle, the lithospheric mantle, and this is the asthenosphere. And this material, this red material, which is dark there, is serpentinized rocks. So I weak, a weak material. So this will be a, a single plate boundary and a little bit of serpentine, serpentinized upper mantle. So this is what you see when you compress this a little bit. You see initiation of a subduction. It's nice because the, the this, this serpentinization layer, I can put it again, becomes the, the subduction interface. However, this is not what we see in our case because you would expect to have a lot of deformation at the surface, almost like an accretionary wedge. So you'll to get there that you know you'll have a subduction zone and you'll get an accretionary wedge, but we don't see this in southwest Iberia. So we decided to do because we know that in southwest Iberia I showed you that there may be actually two fracture zones, not just one single plate boundary, but two fracture zones. And so we decided to run a model with two fracture zones. And it really we get a really funny result. So this was what happened. I can tell you that this was really unexpected. So what do we get? You have a you'll see that this block here in between these two fracture zones, it actually delaminates, it separates from the crust. And then at a certain point, it starts to pull this plate down, to bend it down. We may not be in the situation like this in, in, in nature, but, uh, you know, like it's, it's probably uh, advanced. This is just too advanced um, in relation to what we have. But um, let me just go in here. So maybe we are, but we may be in a situation like this. Okay, so if you start here, this will explain what we see. We see something going down, not much deformation at the surface because all the deformation is being accommodated by this serpentinization layer. And we just have a, a big trust fault over there. Okay, and this is interesting because it shows that 
the laminate this delamination of the lithosphere because of the serpentinization may actually help the the subduction initiation process because at a certain point this this starts to drag down the plate. Okay, so could this be early stage of subduction initiation? My answer is yes. And why? We have we seem to have all the ingredients. So you have the excess of mass, the potential energy. So because we have the 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 Atlantic is getting old, so he has old lithosphere that wants to sink as we start. It's negatively buoyant, it wants to go down. But the question is, you have to break a plate for it to, to actually be able to, to happen. So we need a driving force, and I will argue that maybe the Gibraltar subduction zone was the 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 force that allowed the process to start together with a little bit with the with the collision of Africa with the movement of Africa to the north so you you have a force and you have a weakening mechanism I didn't talk much about weakening mechanism but basically the serpentinization because it it hydrates the plate makes it weaker it actually facilitates the process so it means that you'll need less driving force to start the process there and Finally, I would argue that, you know, it may not be a coincidence that you have a subduction zone starting there, a subduction zone starting there, and you have this situation in here with these big earthquakes like 1755. So I'm not saying we don't understand yet what is going on. This is deep in the, in the bottom of the ocean and below. But I would say that this will be worth to continue investigating. And there's, I think there's a lot of things that will come out from this. For example, we are preparing a IODP proposal and to drill there. So there's going to be a lot of things going out in the next years. So as the, my final thought, I just have a couple more slides. And uh, so is the Atlantic Ocean starting to close? Yes, I think so. In a certain way, at least there and there, because you have subduction zones. It's old. We know that it's getting to getting really old, and we know that the average age of the of the seafloor on Earth is 60 million years, as I showed you in the beginning. So, to maintain this, you know, this young age of the surface, the Atlantic Ocean will eventually have to close. And so, our idea is that, you know, the closure may start as small. Uh, a small initiation in one point, like a, you just push a little bit because you have a driving force and then the system will just tend to propagate. And the Atlantic is actually, you are forcing the system to start subducting in one place, in the, in the Scotty Arc, in the Lesser Antiles. I would argue that this may be a third uh, situation. And, you know, in time, these subduction zones may propagate and we are just running models on, of that. Those models are really heavy. But um, this take, takes time. If, as you can see, this was from 2014, and we have been exploring this idea from to, to a lot of different perspectives. Another perspective is the global one, because when we start to say that the Atlantic was going to close, everybody was saying, no, no, but it's the Pacific Ocean that is going to close. So we had a student that is Anna Davis. Uh, she wrote this really nice paper, Back to the Future, in which she's studying the... She reviewed the, the, the scenarios uh, for the formation of the next supercontinent. Because as I told you, where the subduction initiation starts will dictate how the, the next supercontinental cycle will evolve. So this basically is a scenario that says that the Atlantic open and one day will close again. It's a little bit like the Wilson cycle. There are the scenarios that propose that the Pacific Ocean will close. Some scenarios say, oh, the, the continents are moving to the north, so they, the next supercontinent will form around the North Pole. And for me, was wh wh what was the problem with all these models? Is that, you know, in these models, you do not recycle all the oceanic lithosphere. In this case, the Pacific Ocean remains there. In this case, the Atlantic will open for a long time and will become really, really old by the time that the next supercontinent forms. And here you, in a way, you preserve the Atlantic and the Pacific. So we started to think, like, could it be that the Atlantic and the Pacific 
could close together? Would this be possible to close both the Atlantic and both the Pacific Ocean? And so we came up with a, a few scenarios, and one of the most interesting scenarios that we we published was, and that's why I put this map, you see that there's another ocean, there's the Indian Ocean. And actually, that, there's a circuit of ridges that is not closed. You see that there are these ridge there, there are new rifts propagating there, a small ocean, you have rifts like the Baikal Rift propagating there. So some people think, and I'm one of those people think that the next big ocean, the next super ocean will form somewhere over here. It may break through the Urals, but there's this ridge there, you know, and we came up with a scenario that we published in 2018 in which it we show that it's possible to close the Atlantic and the Pacific. The Pacific is full with subduction zones. The Atlantic is starting to have subduction zones. In 20 million years, these subduction zones may spread. And for the Atlantic and the Pacific to close, you need to open a new ocean that in this case will be like a trans-Asian if you, if you th around the Asia, Trans-Asian Ocean. And this would allow, you know, to close both the Pacific and the Atlantic, which are really getting old. So I'm not saying that this is going to happen, but I think this was just, in, you know, a exercise that makes you think about these things. And this became, this is our Aurica model in which you have the Pacific closing, the Atlantic closing, and the new Trans-Asian Ocean um, forming and okay i think I, I will stop here and i'm i'm really happy to take your questions um i have this if you want to contact me if you want more information if you'd like uh, to have access to papers uh, i'm happy to take your also your questions by email so thank you very much I think that now the house is open for discussion. Deborah, are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Duarte for such an enriching lecture. Uh, we will surely return from this day wiser than we awoke this morning. So uh, let us take a five minute break while we are compiling the questions we have received from the participants. And uh, Dr. Duarte would surely love to answer those questions. On a different note, I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow we shall be having with us Dr. Shantanu Misro, faculty member, IIT Kanpur, at 11 a.m., speaking about partial melting at deep crust, rheology, and seismic properties. We are thankful to everybody for such a wonderful response to our initiative. You shall be receiving the joining links for tomorrow by tonight, 8 p.m. Please wait while we make the questions available to be asked of the speaker. Owing to the vast multitude of questions we have received, we won't be able to accommodate all. However, we shall try to take as many possible to the speaker within the stipulated time. Uh, we are now ready to discuss a uh, few of the questions that we have received. Uh, for the first question, I would like to call Dr. Duarte's attention. Uh, Dr. Uh, Som S. Chatterjee, faculty member from the University of California, San Francisco, has asked a question. Uh, what should be the nature of strain localization for the polarity reversal model of the subduction initiation? Is the remnant Tethian margins of Mediterranean a replicant of passive margin collapse model? Okay, so in two parts. Um, we, we actually run a, a lot of models with uh, testing different parameters. And the polarity reversal implies, basically, you have a subduction zone. And when the plateau arrives to the trench, it's positively buoyant, so it resists uh, subduction. 
and it resists bending because it's also thicker. But what happens is that the ongoing subduction, it, it drags down the overriding plate. And, it, and once you have break breakup of the subducting plate that will have breakup between the subducting plate and the plateau, then in certain specific conditions, the overriding plate will be already down and will sink by its own. Okay. The problem is it just happens in very specific conditions. So the overriding plate needs to be young enough to bend. If it's too old, it will, not, it will resist bending. If it's, yeah, but it needs to be old enough that he has negative buoyance so that the system can go on its own. So we normally see that this subduction of the, 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 the polarity reversal of the overriding plate happens ideally when the overriding plate is between 70 million years and 100 million years. When it has more than 100 million years is too strong to actually bend. It's negatively buoyant, but will resist bending. If it's too young, it will bend, but is not negatively buoyant enough. So this is in 2D. Then in 3D, what is also happening is that the, the, the continuation of the slab on, on the side, as I show in the, in the movie, it will force the plateau to collide with the overriding plate, to indent the overriding plate. So this indentation of the plateau, which is being forced by the lateral subduction zone, also forces the, the overriding plate to, to start to subduct. So, of course, then there may be, there are a lot of other conditions. It will, it will depend on the, on the, if you have pre-existent weaknesses, fracture zone, things like that. But I would say it's, it's not just one parameter, it's a combination of parameters. Um, about the Tetian. Yeah, the Tetian Ocean is a, it's, it's a great example because you know that there was a lot of continents migrating, like a Puglia, so the subduction system was going down, but then there was Beccarc basins and several continental blocks. And I think for a lot of time, these subductions were, were keeping changing polarity, like for example, in the Alps. And this allowed to, you know, sometimes there were ocean basins then closed, but then because subduction was continuing laterally, uh, it forced another subduction zone to form, like the Calabria arc. You see, the, you had the, the, the Alps, and then it formed another subduction in the Calabria. So there was a lot of things going on. It's very complex. I think these models will help us to answer a lot of these questions. But it could be one one situation, like could be the arrival of a passive margin, and then if at at the trench, and then if you have a subduction zone on the other side, it will it may change the polarity. So, but it's very very dependent on the age of the involving plate because you need to have this balance of driving and resisting forces. So, in in some cases, may, the system just shuts down, and you know it's over, subduction stops. So it's not easy. So I showed that movie. It looks really nice, but that's a very specific situation. Like in most cases, the, the system just shuts down. Thank you, sir, for the for the answer. I would like to move on to the next question. I have a question from Devjit Pathak, MSc student from IIT Kharagpur. In the numerical model you showed about the subduction of the overriding plate when the plate encountered a plateau. If we consider that the force keeps on accumulating, can we say that the plateau starts deforming along the subduction zone? Example, the Tibetan plateau kind of extending towards the eastern Himalayan syntaxis. Yes, it will depend. It will depend on the rheology of the plateau. So if the plateau and, and there, there will be a balance between two things. So if the plateau is weak, it will bend and enter the subduction. But because it's positively buoyant, it will resist to subduct. To subduct. It may subduct a little bit, but then will stop. A little bit like in the India. Now the continent may be subducting a little bit because there's still the pull of the slab, but it will eventually stop. The other thing that resists is because the plateau is thicker, it will resist the bending. So it will first start to bend a little bit, but then it cannot bend. So it, it really depends on, on we, we call it the, the bending radius of the plate. If the plate can achieve this bending momentum and, and go down, or if not, otherwise it will just resist. 
And um, I think that's where I think a lot of these models can help, uh, for example, in the Himalaya, because you can test different parameters, because there are a lot of uncertainties in nature. And it's, it's this dialogue between nature and models, simplified models, that can help you maybe also constrain what is going on in, in, in nature. But, uh, but yeah, I think the plateau will deform. It, it, it will deform. It, it may actually even just break in, in pieces, but it depends a lot on its nature. So in that sense, if it's an oceanic plateau, it's really strong. If it's a continental block, it's weak, but it's really thick. So it, it may break, but not bend. So that's, that, again, there's a, a, a fine balance between different parameters. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have two questions which bear a commonality. First, I have uh, Ms. Shruti Saxena, PG student of Delhi University, who asks about the role of volatile bearing minerals in subduction zones. And then I have Orkajoti Pathak from IIT Bombay, who asks, uh, in most studies, the mantle wedge is ignored. How does the mineral phases in the mantle wedge help or impede the subduction of the oceanic slab? Yeah, about the volatiles is that that's not really my 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 expertise, so I cannot say much. Uh, what I can say is that uh, one thing that is really impor important and that that I I investigated myself is the 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 water that gets in the system. So the oceanic slabs are are full with water, uh, either in, in the sediments or in in the in hydrated minerals like serpentine, and when this the, the, the subducting plate enters the subduction channel, then this um, water is released and it actually goes up and, and also do, and, and gets starts to hydrate the base of the overriding plate. And I think that lubricates the, the interface. So I would say that, for example, if the planet Earth did not, not have water, subduction will be impossible. So water is the lubricant of plate tectonics in a certain way. That's what we see. And we start to see a lot of evidence, like, for example, in the Mariana, in the forearc, we have serpentine mud volcanoes. So we know that this serpentine is, is moving in the system and, and going up and being under pressure. And it's coming, popping up as mud, uh, mud volcanoes, serpentine volcanoes. And you see that a lot of this water gets in the, in the back arc volcanism as well, or in the arc volcanism. So the water, I think, is really important. In that sense, the mantle wedge, it's crucial, of course. Uh, the, the mantle wedge needs probably, it's made of hydrated mantle. So it creates, you have a little bit of local convection. There's a few models on that. Uh, I did not investigate that myself. But, um, the, but that's more about dynamics of what happens when you already have a subduction. In this situation, is it's a little bit trickier because subduction initiation is you don't have an interface yet, you don't have a mantle wedge yet, so you have to form it. And that's the, the big question is how do you form it in the first place? And what I'm trying to say here is that it helps if you already have another subduction zone. So you just either change the polarity of an existing one or it propagates laterally. You know, like you think, imagine... Sumatra subduction zone propagating to the south of the Indian plate of the Indian uh, continent. So you already have forces there, you already have fracture zones, you already have a subduction zone. So I think it's, we have to see more as something kind of propagation than just something that just happens spontaneously without, um, without, you know, for a kind of magic. I think that was a little bit. Uh, the idea in the, in the very beginning that people soon realize that, you know, we need very specific conditions for subduction to start. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I have Rita uh, from Jadapur University. He asked, uh, for the Southwest Iberia case, as you have shown, can any faults or discontinuities persistent throughout the lithosphere along depth? It is hard to Imagine a fault which cross cuts the whole lithosphere. Yeah, uh, yes. Like in a sense, it's uh, a passive margin. Uh, it's a rifted margin, right? So 
it was a part of the continent that was rifted. I remember that uh, one Sir Clouting told me that we should not call them passive margins, that we should call them rifted margins, because the faults are there. It was the faults that um, formed in the, in the during the breakup of, of the ocean. But then, of course, they are yield. They you know they just don't move for many millions of years. But uh, I would say that maybe they they still you know if if you study hydrocarbons in in these margins, you realize that you know there's subsidence. So a lot of times these these faults they they preserve a little bit of movement. And then when you go to the lithospheric mantle, then the lithospheric mantle, of course, you know, if if you thicken the lithospheric mantle, then there will be no faults there because it's new lithosphere that is forming, that is cooling. Um, but then I will argue that you you have these fracture zones, and these fracture zones that go from the ocean to sometimes they prolong into the continents. That may be places where the flu and fracture zones are translithospheric. They, they cut through the lithosphere. They may allow water to get in in the system and they will just weaken the lithospheric mantle. And maybe it's not really a fault. That's why when I show you this delamination, it's like a blob. I, it's not, re, I don't, it's not, don't really see it as a, like, I don't like to see initiation of subduction as a, an, a fault forming, but it may start as instability. You know, imagine like inverted plume, like a blob that starts to go down. And then at a certain point, then the deformation localizes. But that's the big, big question is how do you localize the deformation? And what I was showing is that in Southwest Siberia, I think the deformation is did not localized yet. And, you know, most of you are structural geologists and you, you all know that one of the biggest problem in structural geology is this localization problem, is how you localize uh, a fault or you localize a, a really narrow deformation band and subduction is initiation is exactly that you know you need to go from something that is just kind of diffuse deformation to localization in a plate interface and how that happens that's where and i think that's why i think it's important to be here it's where the tectonics and structural geology community really need to come together and one idea would be you know try to identify places on earth and there are a few where you have this uh, subduction initiation zones uh, exposed uh, or, or subduction zones or subduction interfaces exposed in the in land on land and there's a, some colleagues i know that do this work uh, sir i have a question from shukalpo chatterjee university of bern if we need an initial push by one subduction zone to start another how would that give answer to the question of initiation of plate tectonics in the Archean? And how would the serpentinization help at that time? Because most likely in the Archean, the SCLM was not so much hydrated as it is now. Yes, so that's, that's of course, the big question is how you start the first subduction zone. If they are mostly transforming, you know, subduction zones, force another subduction zone, then how you start the, the new one. So the... The thing is that, or there are many different ways of approaching this, but what I would argue is that maybe in the past, because the the, the earth was hotter, uh, there was more energy uh, to, and maybe the plates were less strong. And so may, it may, be, may have been easier to start subduction zones in, in the Archean, or it depends on when you consider that, that plate tectonics started. But uh, I would argue that maybe in the past, subduction initiation was easier. That we tend to see plate tectonics as a kind of a steady state, but we, when you look to these models of planetary geology, you see that plate tectonics may actually be a transient from something that is very active, mental convection and movement at the surface of the planet to a stagnant lead, you know, going something going from Venus to Mars. So maybe the, the past, when you, I think, it's it's you know what what, what we think that this un uniformitarism does may not apply when you look to so deep in the past. So the the dynamics then may have been different. That's what I, my feeling, and that's what I see in the models. For for example, by Jeroen van Unen and and even the people that you know work the like Peter Cowood that work on old uh, tectonics. 
And maybe, as you mentioned, you know, plates were less hydrated, but maybe they were water. Uh, they were water, they were, I don't know, less viscous. So that, again, that's something that it's completely worth investigating. It's how you really start the subduction system. I, I don't have a better answer, but that's something that I would really like to investigate myself one day. But uh, I think the short answer is that the conditions may have been slightly different from what they are now. And be aware that I'm not saying that spontaneous subduction may not be impossible. But uh, that becomes really like we had may actually be possible to for a you know some kind of more spontaneous but uh, what i'm saying is more likely that it starts uh, by induction because it, the, the oceans are end up being connected at some point so at some point it's very likely that the subduction zone will come in this uh, in contact to a, a ocean that is more pristine and it will just migrate there it's just, it's more likely. I'm not saying that there may be, of course, other like plume impacts and things like that that may have an important role uh, in subduction initiation. Uh, without taking any more of your time, I would like to just ask you one more question, and it is from me. Uh, it is uh, fairly uh, wide, well known that it is easier to do such modeling for modern subduction. However, is it possible to extrapolate such models to data obtainable? From earlier ophiolite sequences, and how may such ophiolites provide some hints into the past subduction initiation? Yes, sure. I think like what the, the problem was initiation is that really most of the the things that happen when you have subduction initiation end up in the mantle. So subduction initiation, the the, the following subduction tend to erase. The initiation phase, and that's complicated. There are only a few examples where you may have preserved the, these uh, places of subduction initiation. Uh, ophiolites uh, are one of the most, and you know, I ophiolites and high-grade rocks are one of the evidence of subduction zones. So one of the big questions is when did plate tectonics started, and some people say that plate tectonics started when subduction zones started, because as I showed in the beginning. It seems that presently uh, the subduction zones are the main driver of plate tectonics. However, it's not that it doesn't mean that that was the case in the past. In the past, maybe the, the bottom up, the, the the plumes may have been also really important drivers of mantle convection, maybe more than slabs. So in that sense, they this movement at the surface may have been forced by bottom up movement of of the mantle, and only now. We are because the, the, the lithosphere cools so much, then you're starting to have this top down movement being more important. Uh, I think in that case, that's where the models really are important because, but data is also, data is, I would say, it's the most important thing because if you run models without proxies, without being able to test them, you know, it, it helps, but you are, you are learning about, uh, about, uh, theory but you don't because but it can apply to any planet to any so you have to somehow try to constrain because there are really particular things that occurred on earth uh, that it's i think it's important that we constrain with the observation so yes and models be aware that for me i always like to say this like i don't use models to reproduce nature i use models to test physical uh, parameters so my my like I, I I have to look at nature, and come up with a kind of conceptual model, right? That I want to test. So if the, I see something in nature, I say, oh, if this is like this, maybe this happened that way. And then the models are not to reproduce because if you just reproduce, you just say, oh, it looks like nature, but that's not what you want. You want to understand the, the process. So what you have to do is not just run one model that tries to reproduce your case, but change the parameters and and by doing that then you and if you have these parameters well constrained with data then your model becomes really powerful because it can start to predict things yes predictability capacity so you say if this happened that should happen if that happened that should happen 
and then you can test that. And that's when models are really, really powerful. So it's when you use them. So again, it's not good that you have communities that you know you have the modelers and the field geologists. I think today, and this may be you know my message to the students, even we are having a problem is that because the knowledge is increased so much, we tend to become really specialized in one thing. So you, we are really, really good in only one thing. But that is really a problem because some of these fundamental problems need you to understand a little bit of everything. You know, you have to look to your other fields. You have to look to geodynamics. You have to look to oceanography. You have to look to climate. You have to look to exoplanets. You have to look to planetary geology. You have to look to physics. You have to look to, ke to chemistry. So my advice here, you know, it's not I'm not trying to be patronizing, but that's something that I try to follow myself, is that don't, not, you know, even though you like very much what you do, be aware that it's really important to have a, a, a global thinking and and think about the physics, the dynamics. And as I used to say, like, there's only one science, and that science is physics, and there's only one language, which is mathematics. Geology, in a way, it's the physics of the planet Earth, right? It's Of course, it has a historical component that you go and observe, but we should be able to go a step further than just describing. We have to understand how it forms in terms of the dynamics, in terms of what were the forces that what drove that system to be to be what it is today. So that's um, and models are just a tool. Now models are not. I'm not saying mo modeling is not a discipline. You know, a, a numerical model is like a hammer. You know, it it do whatever you want to do, but you have to use it the best way as possible, but they are not the, they are not the old truth. No, models are just a tool, the, your, like your brain. But, uh... Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much uh, for answering these questions. Actually, I'm receiving more questions. Uh, if you could spare some time to answer a few more, it'd be very yeah, helpful, yeah. sir. If you are not dying yet, I'm very... <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question from Dr. Arindam Bhattacharya, research scholar, University of Chuzad, uh, Hungary. Does the geothermal gradient patterns change when there is an active delamination of the crust? Yes, that's that's uh, a very good question. Um, so the the problem is we are not able. It will be ideal if we could actually measure the heat flow of the of that area but it's really really deep it's five kilometers water depth and we have a few data points of but we don't have much and that's something that we really would like because you would expect to see two things you'll expect to see the first stages of the lamination probably the the abyssal plane will go down will first sink but once you it laminates then you'll have a kind of recovery and then you also will expect to have a, a, a change in the in the in the gradient in the temperature gradient. In our models, we cannot see you cannot really see that because the models are not made. Okay. What I said, these models are very simple in the sense they are isoviscous. Sometimes they have a little bit of complex rheologies. Sometimes you have you know strain. Uh, strain rate dependent uh, rheologies, but we do this step by step. But one of the things, for example, is that we don't have a, a true surface, so a free surface. That's something that we'd like to test because then it will allow you to to you can have, see the stresses at the surface, but you don't really see the surface moving. So for that, we may have need to use a different code, but we are working on that. And um, with that, maybe. We can we we'll, could look to the to the temperature gradients, um, and how, how the heat flow will change. Um, but yes, you would expect to see, and you see a little bit. The, you see a little bit when the, the lamination happens that the lithosphere comes up. So you you the gradient changes. You see that because in our something that I didn't say is that in these models, the base of the lithosphere is not imposed. In the sense that we just put, impose the rheology and it, then we impose the uh, temperature gradient, and the base of the lithosphere is just the 
the 1,200 degrees. So it's when you have this change in temperature. So it's basically an isotherm. So when you see the the you know the mantle going up, you actually see that the the temperature gradient is changing in the models. Unfortunately, we don't have enough data to know if this is also happening in nature. We have we see a signal on gravity that was known from the wars in the 70s. There's a huge the the, the that theory, the Gorringe Bank, is one of the biggest gravity anomalies in the world. It goes from really high to really low. So that's the evidence. Uh, we we this the whole idea of having this IODP proposal is to kind of also bring the community together, the marine geology to go and collect more data. Because again, like there was a lot of studies done in the 20 years ago and then they kind of fade away. People are still studying a lot, but it's mostly superficial stuff like contour heights and, uh, you know, crustal deformation. But we really need to try to have, um, to have deeper data, if, if I'm allowed to say this way. Uh, thank you, sir. I have a couple of more questions from Rohan Roy, Presidency University, Kolkata. In all your models, the plates are already slightly subducted. But if they are not subducted slightly like this, so what can be happened with those models? Are they also subducted by converting the passive margin to active margin? Yeah, okay. So the... the that's that's in a way it's a big question is how you, you know the models of subduction already have to start with instability so the the problem of subduction initiation it can be in a way reduced to how do you produce that instability so how can something start to go down uh, and and that's in a way a little bit the conclusion that i was trying to wrap up so you need to have a driving force somewhere you need to have, and the, the only driving force that seems to have enough force to actually create this instability is another subduction zone nearby. Uh, that can force a plate to collide with another plate and force it to start to go down. B because once it goes down, then it is because it's negatively buoyant, then it, it, it becomes self-sustained. It, it may continue on its own. But it really comes to, and in that sense, is really a physical problem. Is how you create the instability, and the lamination, and that's was was, that's the lamination. It's a kind of a lead that we are exploring. It may not be the answer to all questions, but the lamina, this kind of forced lamination, uh, in a way, it's a way, it's a, a way of creating instability that may propagate. You know. But there may be other ways, of course. But it all comes to that. It's and another thing that may happen, and I think again, that's where maybe structural geologists and geodynamicists should talk, is that sometimes our numerical models are really very clean, idealized. You know, so it starts with very pristine, clean plates with crest and mantle. But we know that in nature there is a memory. The rocks have have uh, um, okay, defects, small defects that tend to increase with time. You know, the, there are pre-existing faults. So it may be that our models are just too clean, and because they are too clean, they are just really strong. So if you start to put some anisotropies and pre-existing faults and you know serpentinized mantle, then maybe these faults will these forces will will reduce and maybe it will be more easier to start the subduction zone. So that's why we ne really need to look at the data and you really need to look at the rheology. And uh, I think that these models, what allows you is to test what a certain what the effect of a certain rheology will be in a large scale. Okay. And, but then you end up in a lot of problems with this, the resolution of your models. You know, if you have capacity to run really high resolution, uh, what are the equations that you are using? And that's a lot. There's you know, a huge amount of colleagues that are doing that work, and, and just have to be wait for it. You know, there's, for example, grain damage. You know, this David Berkovich grain damage may be really, really um, important thing. 
Yeah, that's. Uh, I would like to thank you, sir, for answering these questions. Unfortunately, due to time constraint, we would have to wrap the session up now. Say that we have now come to the fag end of the inaugural lecture of Geochron 2020. I would like to thank Dr. Joao Duarte for taking out time from his busy schedule to be with us here today. We hope to maintain this relationship of love amongst us. We hope to have you with us in the future for any such lecture or workshop. Please visit the Department of Geology, Presidency University, if you happen to find yourself in Kolkata. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure, and thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I think this I, was a great idea, and you should really continue this as a, at a, a more, you know, regular basis. You know, even after the pandemics, I think it's a way to be completely open to the world. Thank and you, sir. Have everyone in in, you know, before you'll say, oh, it's not possible to have this talk because we cannot bring that person here, but now we can all be together online. Yes, sir. I will request everybody to now turn on their cameras for a screenshot to make this moment a memorable one. And I'm happy to visit you one of these days. I will eventually. Yeah, please come. Please come to our place once. Once the, everything becomes normal, Dr. Duarte, please come to Presidency. Okay. Thank you. It's one of the oldest places where from uh, in in Asia uh, where geology started. Yes. So, yeah, and, uh, more than I, 100 years old. I really see it as one of the epicenters of sexual geology, which is great. You know, all the... Thank you so much, sir. Uh, hope to see it's you all right. again tomorrow as we reconvene at 11 a.m. Till then. Adieu and have a nice day. Thank you, sir. Thanks for this Thank you. beautiful talk. Thank you to all. Thank you, Dr. Duarte. Okay, I will disconnect. Bye bye, everyone. Yes, sir. Have a nice day. Thank you so Good much, luck. sir. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. It'll be a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it was mine. It was mine. Good luck with the work. It's working perfectly. Thank you, sir. I hope to find you with us in the near future. Yes, you will either in a in a conference or something, or I'll visit you. But uh, yeah, we'll have to. Sometimes in the conferences, you know, as you say, like Santanu said, we are, you know, we met twenty years ago, almost twenty years yes. ago. This is a small world, so I'm sure we'll see each other again a lot of times. Yes, sir, definitely, please. Yes, sir, and please stay well. These are times of distress globally. Yes, thank you. So, hello. And of course, you are always hello. welcome. I think I've, I... Send you. Send I, I, I talk with Santa, uh, Santanu. I've, I've been, uh, you know, with a lot of your colleagues in, uh, um, in EGU and even uh, some of your, I think, um, colleagues that have been in, in other institutions, like in Amsterdam. Know, working with Walter and so one thing that you can try to do is that there's a lot of uh, schemes in in Europe that you can apply like the Marikuris and and um... hi you are there 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How are Mr. you? Duarte, can I ask you a question? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, when you to you just told that there is a uh, mantle plume is there and the oceanic crust becomes the more thicker and later on it becomes more thick and cool. So because of weight, it's in down. Now weight is in down. That it is there the subduction zone or anywhere it will be start a sinking, breaking and sinking down. Sorry, I'm sorry, can you just repeat the last part? Uh, you just told that the oceanic crust will become thicker and thicker uh, mm -hmm. build, uh, because there is a plume is there and which, which is floating on that plume. So at a time a point, it will more become more thicker and it will just break and sink down into the our into the same uh, ocean. So yeah, it, it when depends. it will be start and at what place it will start, whether near to zone subduction zone or it can be anywhere. Anywhere it will be break down and start sinking down. So if you have a plume and you you get a thicker of the crust, it makes sure the, the oceanic litosphere may, may become more buoyant because the crust is more buoyant. What has to be really thick yeah. is the lithospheric mantle, which is okay. lithospheric mantle is really it's really negatively buoyant, and you get this when you have okay. very old lithosphere. Okay, the plume basically what happens is that it softens the all the old lithosphere because it hits the lithosphere and because it becomes hotter it becomes less strong right? and in that sense okay. if you have a plume if you have the combination of uh, having very old lithosphere and the collision of a plume then the plume will just weaken and then will allow the breaking but because it's very old it will just sink on its own so it's this type of combination of things that you will need you need you need weakening something that weakens that can be hydration serpentinization or a plume and then you need to have the driving force which is a very old oceanic lithosphere and um, that, uh, that's it but yeah so i'm just saying like there's a lot of opportunities in in europe that you you should try to explore and uh, so if you come to come and visit us i'll also try with santanu to write a project so they have some money that you can travel back and forth. Okay, and thank you, sir. See you. Uh... Thank you. Bye bye. Santanu, you want to talk five bye. minutes on the Skype? Uh, yeah, sure. After, the, after this, we'll, we'll go to the Skype. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Have... Bye, sir. Things going on. Bye, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.